My name is Mary Winterston. I'm on the national board uh, of IDA, and I want to thank you for attending this conference. And I get the pleasure of introducing Nancy Hennessy. Uh, Nancy is an experienced teacher, administrator, diagnostician, and consultant in both regular ed and general ed. She served as the president of IDA in t from 2003 to 2005 and has developed teacher training programs. She has delivered keynote addresses, workshops, trainings, and educators nationally and internationally. She is co-author of the module six of letters, if you don't know what letter is, language essentials of teachers of reading and spelling, called Digging for Meaning, Teaching Text Comprehension with Louisa Motes. She is also author of Word Learning and Vocabulary Instruction in Multisensory Teaching of Basic Skills by Brooks Publishing. She is the national trainer of letters and um, it is, uh, was inducted in the honor member of Delta Gamma Society. She is also the 2011 recipient of the IDA Margaret Rawson Lifetime Achievement Award and North Carolina IDA 2012 June Lady Orton Award. Please give me a warm welcome to thank uh, Nancy Hennessy for this afternoon's. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thanks for showing up after lunch. I'm always impressed. <laughs> if you don't have a handout, we were giving them. There's some extra ones up here on the table. So I'll just wait a moment in case anyone wants to come up and get a handout. They're down here on the chair. I know it's always nice to have a handout to follow, right? I know that my handout will be posted if it isn't already, all right? but I just thought it would be good to have a paper copy just in case, just in case. So I hope you're all enjoying the conference. I love coming to the IDA conference. I always feel like it's a homecoming for me. I've been involved with IDA for many, many years and have made wonderful friends such as Mary, so I appreciated her introducing me. How many of you are classroom teachers? Special education teachers? Clinicians, speech, language, psychologists. How many of you are consultants? Yeah. Literacy leaders, coaches, and so on. Parents? Anyone I missed? Yes. A tutor. Okay, wonderful. So look at this wonderful array of individuals that we have in the room. I'm hoping what I have to say to you today on meeting the challenges of comprehension instruction, a blueprint for comprehensive approach, not only hoping, I know it will be meaningful for each and every one of you, but I do want to say this to you. You've come into the room with your own knowledge base and your own experiences. So I want, as I have this conversation with you, to connect to your own practice. My conversation has no meaning if you don't make connections to your practice, to working either with your colleagues or, your, or working with those children that your colleagues or you serve. So please make as many connections as possible. I'm going to share a journey with you today, and we'll be talking about the role of theoretical models and reading comprehension. And for those of you who are letters groupies, and I see some in the audience, <laughs> this will sound familiar to you. For those of you <clears throat> who have not taken letters or something similar, it might be new information, and hopefully you'll be able to make connections to something you already know. We're also going to talk about a framework for reading comprehension. Now, this framework is an instructional framework. I'm not going to talk about unit organizers. I'm not going to talk about lesson plans. I'm going to talk about a framework that is based on the evidence, that is based on what we know about reading comprehension that can support how we prepare for instruction. I'm also going to share some experiences with you in constructing a curriculum that's knowledge-based. <clears throat> I'm very fortunate to work with AIM Academy. Some of you may have heard AIM mentioned a few times. They're one of the sponsors. <clears throat> I'm the Director of Professional and Academic Practices at AIM. I live on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. AIM is in Conshohocken, Pennsylvania, and I spend one week each month um, at AIM Academy working directly with them on curriculum instruction and professional development. It's wonderful because it puts me back in touch with teachers and with students, and it allows for me 
to um, <clears throat> have my own lab <laughs> to try out and to work with these wonderful, wonderful colleagues um, on some of these frameworks and instructional approaches that um, we want to be so meaningful for students with language-based learning disabilities, dyslexic students, but know that what I'm going to share with you today can be used with any student. <clears throat> I'm also going to talk about then the framework and how you translate that into practice, right? And so we'll look at language processes and skills, and we'll think about what approaches <clears throat> align with what it is that the evidence has told us, what the research has told us. I'm very much about being informed, about having the answer to why are you doing that each time you put in place a strategy and activity or use an approach for a student. Your why should be reflective of what we know thus far about how we learn, and in this case, how we make meaning. The whole goal here, as I've said, <clears throat> in terms of each one of these components, is so that all of our students, including those who struggle, will have the opportunity to acquire and be capable of using the essential language and cognitive skills necessary for making meaning of text. For those of you who know me, um, and you've been coming to IDA for a while. Sorry, I have a bit of a cold, so I'll try not to let that interfere. <clears throat> you know that in my past life, I was very much a decoding queen, right? I'm a former Wilson trainer. I have OG background. But as I worked more and more with teachers and with students, I became more and more aware of the fact that we know very little about comprehension. And my work with Louisa Motes and with my letters colleagues, Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling, particularly in the area of comprehension, set me on a new path. And that new path has everything to do with how do we go about helping our students to acquire the knowledge base that's necessary for them to both construct, extract, and construct meaning. So that's what today is all about. Now, I thought I'd just give you a few thinking tools for the future, all right? I didn't create a reference or resource list, but if you email me, I'm happy to share some references and resources for you. So when I think about comprehension, I always think about what are my go-to books, right? What are my go-to journals um, in terms of thinking about what the research, what the evidence is telling me that makes a difference for students in terms of comprehension? And so you see some that I'm sure are familiar to you, including two of Kate Kane's books. I'm a Kate Kane groupie. I'll admit to it. If you haven't read any of Kate Kane's articles or books, I would encourage you to do so. She's a Brit. And Kate is probably, for me, the foremost researcher in terms of comprehension difficulties. You also see letters there, of course. I'm a co-author with Louisa and I owe a great deal to Louisa for setting me on this path and giving me an opportunity to dive more deeply into comprehension, so Module 6. You see the voice of evidence, which I'm sure you've heard quoted before. You also see a new book that I've put up there, Cultivating Knowledge and Building Language. And actually, the author of that book is Noni Lasso. And Noni is at Harvard, and her interest is in academic language, but particularly for ELL students. So the book was written with a focus on ELL students, but I have to tell you, as I read the book, I thought to myself, this is about students with language-based learning disabilities as well, because so much of the information within that book connected to what I believe about making meaning. And then, of course, you see Reading for Understanding, a seminal work that followed the National Reading Panel report. You can go online. You can download that. <clears throat> it's a few years old now but um, it's the Rand Reading Study Group report that looks at what do we know about comprehension, what don't we know, what should we be investigating, and really kind of set purpose for the last few years. So those are all very good resources, and I invite you to take a look at any one of them. All right, so let's, let's see if we can not get ourselves engaged and involved here a little bit. And I'm going to ask you now to do a quick write. So you have a handout, so you can write on that or anything else that you might have handy. And I want you to think about this question. What exactly is reading comprehension? Now, I've given you a little definition there. I, I say it's the quintessential growth construct. I'll explain to you what I mean by that in a moment. But go ahead and take maybe 30 seconds, no more than a minute, to write your definition of reading comprehension. What do you think it is? 
Let's just take about 10 more seconds to finish. All right, so what exactly is reading comprehension? Now, usually I'm down there on the floor interacting with you, but there's no uh, lavalier mic up here, so I can't come down to you, all right? Uh, but I don't mind you calling out. We can misbehave here a little this afternoon, all right? So anyone, shout it out. What do you think reading comprehension is? Anyone from this section over here? Thank you very much. Uh, how are you, Diana? All right, so making connections. Someone from over here. Gaining meaning from text, yeah. I love that, taking what is read to influence our writing and speaking. And someone from the middle group here. Yeah, all the way in the back. Wow, knowledge extracted and synthesized from text. What a nice job you all did. All right, let me share, first of all, the quintessential growth construct idea. <clears throat> you know, when we learn to read words, word recognition, once we learn how to read words, we know how to read words. And we have a self-teaching hypothesis, David shares self-teaching hypothesis, in which our knowledge of how words work allow us to read new words that we haven't encountered before. So while we can add to those words we are reading, we basically have mastered or figured out we hope, how to go about recognizing words. But comprehension is a little different. Just think about this conference. Have some of you added some information to your background knowledge while you were here? Perhaps you've added a few new vocabulary words. Maybe you've had some opportunities to make some additional connections, maybe some inferences about what it is that you're learning. So comprehension continues over our lifetime. Whereas our word recognition skills, we do come to new words, we read them, but we basically have the skills to do that once we've learned how to do that. Okay. Let's see how some others define reading comprehension, and some of you have seen these definitions before, and I particularly like these two because they, they really contrast thinking about reading comprehension. The first one comes directly from the RAND Reading Study Group report, and it talks about a process of simultaneously extracting and constructing meanings, similar to what we just heard from um, one of our participants in the back of the room. Right? For me, the key word here is process. Right? The second definition comes from um, the National Governing Board Association. And as you take a look at that, just take a moment and read it. Oh, well, that, thank you for telling me that. It's up on my, um, well, now it is. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. <laughs> All right, take a moment and read that second definition. So that definition is much more focused on product, right? So the first one's focused on process. What are the language skills and processes that are necessary to extract and construct meaning? The second definition is much more focused on, can our students do this? Can they demonstrate an understanding? And in classrooms, we're very focused on product. But I have to say to you, as I've thought more and more about comprehension, my perspective is that in order to produce a product, you have to have processes in place. And those processes very much relate to what? They relate to language and cognitive skills. So this is my favorite definition of comprehension, right? It is a complex task. We all know that. Some of you may have heard you cat speak. You may have been in his session, right? It is a complex task that involves what? A range of language and cognitive processes and skills. So as I thought about this definition, I thought to myself, you know what? This calls for much more thinking about a foundational understanding of cognitive and language processes that are involved in comprehension. The standards call for products, but products are the result of developing effective processes through instruction. So what exactly are those language and cognitive processes and skills? And we have models that we can turn to, models that many of us are familiar with. So here's one model that we can turn to. And I think many, if not all of you, are familiar with Hollis Scarborough's rope. 
So when we look at Alice Scarborough's rope, she defines skilled reading as this ability to do what? To read the words and make meaning simultaneously, to do so in a fluent manner. Well, how do we arrive at this ability to read proficiently, to do both of those things? Well, the lowest strands of the rope have everything to do, as you know, with word recognition, and we can think about what are those processes, skills that go into the development of word recognition. We can think about how they are developed independently, but they're also interrelated, and how critical they are for word recognition. Our focus, though, are the strands in the upper part of the rope today. What are the language processes and skills that we need to engage in? What are the listening comprehension skills that we need to have? What is the oral language base that has to be in place in order for students to make meaning? And of course, this is Hollis's synthesis, um, a a meta-analysis of research, and she uses the analogy of the reading rope to represent proficient reading for us. So just very quickly looking at those strands of the rope, what does she tell us? Well, we need to have background knowledge in place. So how critical is background knowledge? Today I'm going to talk to you about a knowledge-focused curriculum. Deep knowledge. How do we bring that about for students? What else do we have to have in place? Well, we need vocabulary. And of course, vocabulary certainly connects to background knowledge. We need breadth, many, many words that we recognize. We need depth. We need to be able to own words and use them with precision. We also need to be able to work with language structures and move from the oral to the written text. We need to think a bit about how syntax carries meaning, syntax and semantics hand in hand. And I've heard a few people over the last two days mention the importance of syntax in terms of reading comprehension. What else is necessary? Well, we need to be able to bring that background knowledge and infer. We need to be able to reason. We need to move to higher levels of thinking, deep thinking about our text. We also need a knowledge of, as we move from oral to written language, what's the difference between oral discourse and written discourse? What do discourse structures look like? Certainly little ones, we start with conventions of print and moving left to right, and that the words carry the meaning unless it's a totally picture book, right? But once we get them involved in book, right, they have to understand that books are organized in certain ways, that there are different discourse structures. So all of these strands of the rope woven together over time, right, allow for students at different points in time to work with text whether we're talking about narrative text, informational text, whether we're talking about poems, short stories, all those different variations on a theme in terms of genre. Any one of the strands of that upper part of the rope frayed, then comprehension is in jeopardy. Now, some of those strands contribute more to comprehension than others, but they all work together. They're all interrelated. The same thing goes for the bottom part of the rope. So I guess for me, I keep thinking about this rope and other theoretical models. I'm going to change up in a minute to Kate Kane's work. I keep thinking about what does that suggest for instruction? If I acknowledge that comprehension in order to extract and construct meaning involves these language and cognitive processes and skills, doesn't that mean that my instruction should be reflecting the development of all these different processes and skills? Kate Kane, let's turn to her work and a graphic that I use to represent her work. Kate Kane says to us, and she works with Jane O'Kill, she says, you know, when we come to print, students have to be able to work with the words, and we know when our students can't work with the words and we want them to engage in text, we accommodate them until they can work with the text. We provide lots of practice with decodable text, But we also want to provide them with text that builds language. And so we read aloud, or we provide learning ally, or we provide other means that they can access the text. Well, she says, when you come to the text, you read the words. But what also is going on with students as they come to text? What's happening in their mind? We've got Kayla up there in the right-hand corner. My granddaughter. Yes, I'm shameless. I admit it. I always use my grandchildren's pictures. 
What's going on in Kayla's mind? And Kate says, well, she has to make me, she has to make some sense of the meaning of the words, right? But she also has to connect up the sentences. And she has to integrate her background knowledge. Because what we want Kayla to do is walk away, or your students, to walk away with what we call a mental model or a situation model of the text itself. It's this overall understanding that allows for you to come to similar texts, similar situations in the future, and apply your knowledge. So I've represented Kate's words in this way. Our students have to work with words and phrases. They have to work with what we call academic vocabulary. And I'm going to ask you in a moment to think about academic language. But I'll tell you for now more sophisticated words. They have to work with figurative language. And oftentimes we talk about the use of inference for figurative language as well. So they're working with the meanings of the words, right? the meanings of phrases, such as figurative language. They also have to work with the sentences. And again, when we think about academic language, what do we know about these sentences? They're long. They have many ideas. They have embedded phrases and clauses. And the ideas within them are connected up by the use of something called cohesive ties. They also have to integrate their background knowledge. What does that mean? It means they have to have schema. And by the way, their knowledge of text structures is also background knowledge. And where is this all going? They work at the surface level of the text with the exact words and syntax the author provided. They work at the text base. What did the author assume you would bring to the text and you would integrate with? And they form, we hope, this mental model, a coherent representation of text. In other words, all the ideas hang together and it makes sense to them and they walk away with an understanding, not every detail, but an understanding of what they've read. So we have this interaction between the text and the mind of the reader. All right. Well, that accommodates, I think, for the language processes and skills that Kate Kane speaks to us about, as well as what you saw in the rope. But what about the cognitive skills? So I've laid over the top of this uh, graphic, um, I've laid some symbols here, or boxes, um, that represent some of the cognitive processes described by Judith Irwin. Some of you may know her work. And this directly aligns with the language processes and skills. Students engage in what are called microprocesses. They have to extract the idea units, the ideas and the idea units. They need to integrate those idea units. Oh, this sentence goes with this sentence, with that sentence back there. They also have to monitor whether or not they understand. Do I understand the meanings of these words? Am I clear on what the ideas were within this particular sentence and how they link up with the following sentence and the one after and the one after and the one after? They also need to be elaborating on what it is that they're reading. And here we're talking about using your background knowledge or schema to elaborate on what the author has provided for you. And then last but not least, they engage in macro processes. So how many times have you said to a student, can you summarize that for me? What's your understanding of this? So in combination, in combination, we want for our students to be able to do what? To develop the language processes and skills, these cognitive processes and skills that allow for them to make meaning. Because one of the things that we certainly know is that there is this dynamic interaction going on. It's not just what the reader brings. It's also what the text presents. It's also about the context, your classroom, your clinic, your setting. Right? And it's also about your instruction. All of these things interact as the student comes to text and tries to make or create this coherent representation of text. So construction, I don't think my animation came up, did it? The little thing go woo -woo around? <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. Okay. Construction occurs moment by moment as the reader proceeds through the text within the conditions set by the text and the context. Okay. So what's the point of what I've said thus far? I asked you to define comprehension. I provided you with a definition that focused on language processes and skills. And then I asked the question, what language processes and skills? And I've just discussed with you the upper strands of the rope 
and the way that Kate Kane views this in terms of the reader and the text interacting and using those language processes and skills as well as cognitive capabilities. So we've just check, finished this very first section. What is the role of theoretical models in reading comprehension? Here's what I'd like for you to do for the next two minutes. I'd like for you to turn and talk or pair share. If you need to turn around, swivel around, get up and move for a moment. And I'd like you to share with one another your understanding, your mental model of what I've just conveyed to you. Let's take two minutes to do that. All right, if I can ask you to finish your conversations. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now that we've had this conversation about reading comprehension, your definitions, the definition I provided, and we've talked a bit about language processes and skills as well as cognitive overlay here, let's talk now about a framework for reading comprehension because, after all, I said I was going to give you a blueprint, right? Okay. So... I kept thinking about, could I help teachers organize up their instruction, prepare their instruction, by creating a framework that would, in fact, reflect everything we knew about the language processes necessary? Remember, the product is what we want, but how do we develop the process? And so what I developed was an organizer or a guide, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, and you have in your handout for the delivery of texts that are read for different purposes. So I want to be very clear. This is not a lesson plan. There's no way you could do what's on this framework in one day. Right? It's not even a unit organizer. At AIM, right, where I consult and work, we have unit organizers that go along with our ELA curriculum for our students. And they reflect back to the framework. But this is not a lesson plan. This is not a unit organizer. It is a framework. It is meant to prompt teachers, instructors, tutors, to think about how to prepare the text for their students with differentiated needs. So we'll talk about that in a moment. It aligns directly with the language comprehension strands of the reading rope and these multiple cognitive processes that we've just talked about. And it addresses both process and product demands. So what does it look like? Well, here it is, right? So the framework is intended, right, as teachers design and deliver curriculum, as they write unit organizers or lesson plans, to step back, look at the text that they're preparing, whether that be narrative, informational, persuasive, whatever it is, whether it be a poem, a short story, a play, a novel, a chapter book, to step back and to think a little bit about how they might frame their instruction over more than one day. So it begins by asking for an identification of critical understandings. You know, you'll see in a moment when I talk about a knowledge-focused curriculum, which is what we have at AIM, we identify what we call either enduring or critical understandings by unit, and students in the lower school spend anywhere from four to six weeks in a unit focused on those critical understandings or enduring understandings with different texts. In fifth grade, anywhere from eight to ten weeks because their readings are longer but they're focused on a critical understanding. What do you want your students to take away? What are the big ideas? What's the mental model that you're creating? Right? Secondly, what's your purpose for reading the text? And that might differ day by day. It might be on one particular day you're going to focus on vocabulary. It might be another day you might be focusing on different levels of questions. It might be another day you're working on writing that pertains to the text. By the way, I truly believe that children should write about what they're learning about. So you're going to see, when we come to the end of the framework, where it says expression of understanding, you're going to see that writing is one way that we talk about students expressing 
their understanding or creating a product. All right, what's the, what's the second part here? We're into the text reading now. So we've thought about our critical understandings of text. We can think about different purposes dependent upon the day that we're providing instruction. And now we're into text reading. So as I step back from my text, what do I have to think about? I have to think about which words I'm going to teach. So the questions that teachers need to ask themselves are, which words will your <clears throat> students need to know are worth knowing? In other words, you're going to directly, explicitly teach those words. You can't teach all of them. So you have to think through which ones are you going to teach. And we're going to delve a little bit more deeply into this whole area in a few minutes. Which ones will you, in you intentionally target? Which words will you incidentally on purpose teach? You know, you can't, those words that you can't teach, how will you go about facilitating your students' understanding of those other words? Are you going to teach them word learning strategies, like morphology or the use of context? Are you going to do point of contact teaching? Will you provide a synonym or a substitution in the moment? Okay. So which will you incidentally on purpose discuss? Question how you will foster the use of independent word learning strategies. Is there figurative language that requires explanation? So guiding questions to be thinking about as you prepare your text. Then moving on to language structures, phrases, clauses, sentences. Are there phrases, clauses, sentence structures that may be difficult for your students? Connectives, things like conjunctions and cohesive ties. When and how will you teach your students to work with these? Remember, we build meaning by, through word and sentence, then connections between sentences, integrating background knowledge, and then an overall understanding of text. Where could the breakdown occur? It could occur at the sentence level. Schema and text structure. What background knowledge, schema, is critical to understanding the text? What strategies, activities will you use to surface, build, and connect? How is the text organized? That's part of background knowledge. How will you teach students to use the structure to understand purpose, organize, and express understanding? And then levels of understanding. And I mentioned these words already. Surface level. The answers are right there. Text base, you have to integrate your background knowledge. Mental model, they're more application questions. So what strategies and activities, questions, will you use to facilitate student construction of different levels of understanding before, during, and after reading? And then last but not least, what about expression of understanding? Now notice that the arrow goes both ways. I'm not all about this happens before, then this happens, then this happens. No, this is integrated throughout. There are some things you might do before. For instance, you might make a decision that there are particularly difficult sentence structures, and you're going to pull out a sentence or two before you begin reading each day and work with your students on deconstructing that sentence. Or you might decide there's particularly difficult figurative language, and you're going to pull that out and work with your students before you begin working. Or maybe there's some additional background knowledge. You might do that whole group, sorry. <laughs> you might do that whole group. You might do it small group. You might even do it individually, because this allows for differentiation. So you can view this as preparation for whole class but you also can view this as, this is what all my students need, but some need more of this or less of that. But I think if we acknowledge that the language processes and skills, that reading rope tells us, and Kate Kane tells us, these are the things students have to have in place, we need to be certain that we're developing these if they're not already in place. Okay, so that's the framework. Now as we think about this framework, we have some real challenges. We have challenges in terms of how we use the, use the framework, right? So again, at AIM Academy, we have an expression. We say we teach literacy all day long, and we do. We integrate the framework throughout our ELA classes. Remember, the students at this particular school have language-based learning disabilities, but we're also using this framework in a public school setting as a Tier 1 instructional framework. Okay. But we do need to be able to step back and think a little bit about the design of curriculum and instruction that develops these skills, but also 
provides enough opportunity for students to develop the academic language that our students need to meet standards. We also need to be thinking about the teacher or the instructor or the tutor or the clinician. What's the essential knowledge base that they need in order to make informed decisions about what this instruction looks like? And then, of course, we have to think about our students. All of our students deserve quality instruction. Each student brings a unique constellation of skills to the classroom, and their profiles will differ, and instruction must be differentiated based on those individual differences. So thinking about the framework, if we think about that for all of our students, but who needs more, who needs less? Who needs small group instruction? Who needs to be worked with individually? What is it that we need to do to be certain they're going to be successful with the text? Now, I put something down in the lower right-hand corner because I wanted to share something with you about a double-dose comprehension for students who have comprehension needs, right? So AIM is a very unique place um, in that it is a school for students with language-based learning disabilities. But it's not so unique to this audience. The majority of students have what kind of difficulty? If you were thinking about the rope, word recognition, right? So students who are dyslexic primarily have word recognition difficulties. They don't always have difficulties with comprehension. I'm not going to say they can't. There will be some, you know, that will have that difficulty. But more often than not, they have word recognition difficulties. If, in fact, they're denied access to print, we know over time the dyslexic student can fall behind in terms of background knowledge vocabulary, and then comprehension does become an issue for them, right? Okay. Well, we had a group of students about two or three years ago, and then the following year, and this year not quite as many, um, within AIM Academy, that did not have word recognition skills difficulties. Wow, that was kind of a surprise, right? but they had language comprehension difficulties. And interestingly enough, all right, I had read this article not so long ago um, by Spence and, and Wagner, in which they talked about the fact that when you talk about reading comprehension difficulties, you're really talking about language comprehension difficulties. All right? And interestingly enough, Kate Kane also has said, you know, when kids have poor comprehension, more often than not, they are going to have difficulty with these particular skills. They're going to have difficulty with integration and inference making. I just want you to think a little bit about what I said about how those levels of language processing work. You have to integrate the ideas within and between sentences, and then you have to integrate background knowledge. So Kate Kane is saying they have difficulty with that. They have difficulty with comprehension monitoring. Oh, I had that on the arrow going up and down throughout the framework. And they had difficulty with knowledge and use of story structure. That's, those are kind of primary characteristics of kiddos who have language comprehension difficulties, difficulties with making meaning. So we had to think a little bit about these students that were presenting that needed, needed the setting that we had, to think about what will we provide for them in addition to the English language arts classes, right, in which we present a challenging curriculum, We'll talk some more about that in a moment, in which we use the framework. What else would we have to do for these particular students? And so we created a class, and I'll just go back for a moment. I put the name, which we called Comprehensive Literacy. You see it down there in the lower right-hand corner, in which we double-dose the kids. Well, what do we do for double-dosing the kids? Well, we gave them assessments. You know, our kids come to us with many assessments. We use Ames Web. We looked at their May scores. We used the QRI. We did a test of narrative comprehension. We used one of the subtests off the self. We did a test of listening comprehension. But probably most important of all, we asked their teachers. And we asked them to reflect back on their classroom observations based on the rope based on the levels of language processing, because that's a part and parcel of what they do every day. And then we designed a curriculum that still used the framework, 
What we designed shorter lessons in terms of text was five times a week, 60 minutes a day, right? We followed the framework, but we zeroed in on where the individual needs were for students. And the first unit was literature-based. The second unit was based on science. The third was based on social studies. The fourth was based on what we call our interactive humanities class. The selections were short. They were primarily expository text, right? And they directly aligned with the enduring understanding, so we went deeper into a knowledge base for them, into a development of vocabulary by double dosing them. And I thought that might be important to say to some of you who have students with specific comprehension problems. Okay. All right. So let me go here a little further then. So what are we talking about here? So we're talking about constructing this curriculum and knowing that what we were going to have to do was design and deliver a curriculum that was knowledge focused, that was academic language focused if we're going to prepare our students to meet the standards. Right? but also could accommodate for these individual needs. And we also knew we would have to support our educators, all right? and I've talked about this in many different places, so I've supported educators in many different ways in terms of understanding comprehension and what it is that you can do about it and how to use the framework. So what about this curriculum? Okay, So that little piece was all about the framework. All right. Before I move on, any questions about the framework? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're talking about the comprehensive literacy class, yeah? Okay, so in the comprehensive literacy class, we did those assessments to begin with. We identified what the needs were of students, all right? The teacher constructed a curriculum for that class, and then she differentiated within the curriculum based on what the needs of the students were. So if they were falling below average in vocabulary, you know, she had to have an extra focus on vocabulary. And yes, sometimes it, it was very, it's very lovely, and all of the kids need the same thing, and sometimes they need different things. So they still had to address all of the parts of the framework. What I would say is there was a very special emphasis on background knowledge and on vocabulary because those are critical contributors to understanding. Any other questions about the framework or what I've just said about comprehensive literacy? Okay. So let me tell you about the curriculum. Okay. So what's a little different about the curriculum I'm going to talk about is it's not a core curriculum. It's not out there for you to purchase. It's not level books. It's not decodable books. All right? Decodable books are wonderful, but they're focused on word recognition. And level texts are focused on different things. We could have conversations about that, right? right? But what we wanted to do was we wanted to construct a curriculum that would focus on critical understandings, that would be based on a deep knowledge base necessary to work with complex texts across disciplines. Remember we said teach literacy all day long? Okay. We wanted to be able to identify readings that were necessary to support the development of academic language. More about that in a moment. And we also wanted to be able to integrate then within that framework instructional approaches and options including routines, strategies, and activities that we knew would be effective for all of our students. So we began with this idea of critical understandings. So what do I mean by a critical understanding? We've called these enduring understandings as well, right? Well, a critical understanding really represents a synthesis of what individuals should understand, not just know or do, as a result of reading or studying a particular content area. So we had to ask ourselves, what's the essential knowledge base we want to develop within and across grades and disciplines? And I'll tell you how we initially worked on this. A number of years ago, the director of curriculum and myself, with some input from other staff members, sat down and looked at E.D. Hirsch's core, core knowledge curriculum. Some of you know that. We looked at um, the Pennsylvania standards. The school is in Pennsylvania. 
we looked at what our teachers were doing. We had pretty savvy teachers, right, what they were reading in each grade level. We also thought about our interactive, what we now call humanities class. And our interactive humanities class is an arts-based approach to looking at different time periods across time, examining the art, the history, the politics, the geography, and so on. So just very briefly, you know, um, in fifth grade, for instance, and two of our teachers were presenting on a research project today in the posters about this, um, in the fifth grade, our kids go to Renaissance Club, a period in history. They've worked up to it. They start in Cave Club in first grade. Okay? And in Renaissance Club, they all become characters of the Renaissance. So you get to meet Leonardo da Vinci. He's sitting there. In fact, one of the kids is Leonardo da Vinci, and so on. And they live the era, they live the period. So we looked at what the focus was, what, what the big ideas that came out of each one of those time periods. So it was a combination of thinking through what are these critical concepts and understandings that we want our kids to know, not only in English language arts, but also in interactive humanities. We looked at science, we looked at our social studies, we looked at math. Okay? Because we realize that literacy is not something that happens only within the confines of one class period a day. It's the responsibility of all to teach, broaden, and reinforce language and executive skills that are critical to developing students with strong reading and writing skills. So we didn't just want this big idea or enduring understanding to only be something that you talked about in English language arts and you were done. We wanted to make as many, whoops, sorry, as many connections as possible for students. So I know you're sitting here thinking, well, what are these critical ideas and understandings she's talking about, right? All right. Well, of course, we went back to the teachers. We asked for their input. And we're actually in the midst of revising these. So you're going to see this is a draft. All right. It's not done. <laughs> we're still working on it. Across a school year, teachers work within three to four units in English language arts. Their critical understandings connect to the interactive humanities and, when possible, to math, science, and social studies. So if you look across, you see critical topics, grade one alphabet books. Well, what will we get out of alphabet books? What would the critical understanding be there? Well, we actually want our kids to understand that letters represent sounds and form words, and that words form stories, and books convey ideas through print. That's the critical understanding. Right? That's the first unit. There are three more. In grade two, the first unit is building bridges with unlikely friendships. Hmm. What's the big idea or enduring understanding? Understanding the characteristics and traits associated with friendship. What does friendship mean? That's a big idea. And it can look differently in different situations. And so the texts, all right, the texts are all different. They're expository, they're informational. Their narrative in grade three, perseverance. Wow, that's an interesting idea. Understanding the role of perseverance in overcoming challenge. You bet they can connect to that one, right? And then in grade four, whether or not, the impact of weather. And in grade five, animals in society, everything to do with ethics leads to a conversation about ethics in terms of treatment of animals. So this is just a little sampling, but having conversation, thinking through, we're going to really, really delve deeply into these topics so that our students have an understanding based on multiple texts, not one text, not one story, not one selection. Okay. So I thought I would also share with you one that I'm going to be using today from fourth grade. And here the critical topic is revolutionaries. Okay. This happens to be Judith Salomones. She just developed a unit on this and was willing to sh share. And notice that she's got more than one critical understanding, but it sort of culminates in the last one. Revolutionaries are individuals who challenge accepted notions and come up with a new way of thinking about something. They often face resistance and struggle to make a change in the world. They can impact the past and the present, but they also can have an impact on the future as well. So you can use different readings for those different ideas or understandings, and then you arrive at, we can learn a variety of life lessons from 
revolutionaries. Right. So one, we had to step back, we had to think about what are these big ideas we wanted across our grade levels, across a year. Then we had to think about the right readings, the right texts. Right. Well, in thinking about this, we had to ask ourselves, what readings reflect the knowledge base, the critical understandings we identified? Can we match the text to the idea? Will the reading provide opportunities to develop language processes and skills, academic language? I will tell you now that all of the readings that we use with our students who have language-based learning disabilities, as well as the readings that we're using in two public school settings in Philadelphia, low-income schools, are grade and age appropriate. They're grade and age appropriate. Why? Because we want our students to develop the academic language, think the strands of the rope, vocabulary, background knowledge, sentence structure, and so on. We want them to develop what all other kids are developing. Now, do we expect them to read those texts? No, we read them to them. Or they listen to them until they can read them. So the texts are age and grade appropriate. We also asked, do the readings represent different genre, disciplines? For instance, you heard me say in that comprehensive literacy class, but not only there, a focus on using readings that connect back to that critical understanding that are math-based, science-based, social studies-based, and so on. Okay. Related to purpose. So I always want to ask teachers why they choose texts, you know, and why you use different kinds of texts. Like, what is the purpose of a decodable text? You all know the answer to that. What's the purpose of level texts? What's the purpose of grade and grade-appropriate texts? You know, think about what it is that we are doing with our students, and that then pushes us in a particular direction. All right, we're going to do a quick lexicon check now, because I've used this word several times. What is academic language? What are its characteristics, and why is it important? And I've given you some hints as we've gone along here. You need to partner up now again, all right? Partner up and have a quick conversation about what you think are the answers to those three questions. All right, if you can finish your conversation. So if this is what you were talking about, you're spot on. So academic language is the language of school. It's the language of text. It's the language of workplace. It's standards related. It is not our everyday conversation. It is the language that our students need in order to work with complex texts. When we think about academic language, we can think about vocabulary. And when we say that the vocabulary is academic, we really mean that it has Latin or Greek origins. Or it's semantically complex or abstract. Think of the word freedom. That's pretty abstract, right? Or it's nuanced or it's technical. We also can classify vocabulary in different ways. We can say there's discipline-specific vocabulary, which is academic. Think about science, you know, protoplasm, right, biochemistry, all those different terms. We can talk about general academic vocabulary. And if you know Beck's work, the tier two words, right, more abstract. We know the base. We find them in multiple contexts. We also can talk about, and I've added one here, connectives. I'm going to do a little bit of work with you before you leave today on connectives. Little words like conjunctions and cohesive ties that connect up ideas. We have to teach kids the meanings of conjunctions. Okay. When we talk about academic language and grammar or syntax, we're talking about complex sentences. And you saw that on my chart before. Sentences that are very long have multiple ideas in them, have embedded phrases, clauses, have nominalizations in them. We can also talk about discourse structure. Every time I think about discourse structure and I step back, I think we do a good job of teaching kids about story form and, you know, the different types of paragraphs, but boy, that is so simplistic in comparison to what discourse structures actually look like and the different structures that you find in different disciplines. So we have complex, varied purposes and formats. And then academic language, the language of text, is informationally dense. Not only are the sentences dense, the information is dense. So how is it that we get our students to a place 
where they're able to deal with this. And Noni Lasso says to us, meaning-related skills fundamentally involve language comprehension. And I think I've said that more than once now today. That's why I liked your book so much. Language development is inextricably linked to children's growth as readers. We have to keep thinking about that, how we use language, both oral and written. We cannot let the language of print impede our students' progress. That's why we use grade and age-appropriate texts, whether they can read them or not. We have to be intentional about building academic language. Now, Shanahan said a while ago, they'll be frustrated by these challenging texts, and we have to think about instructional supports in order for them to succeed. That's why we have a framework. So while I'm talking about the framework in the context that I've been using it, it can be used in multiple contexts. That's why we have a framework to scaffold and support the teacher's preparation of the lesson. All right. So let me go past this. So when we begin to think then a little bit about these books that support academic language for our student, I thought you might like to see some examples. So our teacher at fourth grade, Julia, who was kind enough to lend this to me, these are all the different selections she's going to be using. She's a fourth grade teacher. Over a period of time, as she teaches the unit on revolutionaries, look at all the different types that are represented here. Giant Steps to Change the World, Spike Lee and Tanya Lewis Lee. Of Thee I Sing, A Letter to My Daughters by Barack Obama. Albert Einstein, Dear Benjamin Banneke, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Surveyor of the Sky. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. These are all revolutionaries, but in different ways. So building, building a deep knowledge base related to that one term and thinking about how do revolutionaries impact us? What are some life lessons we can learn from them? So as we think about the curriculum, we think about these deep understandings, these critical understandings, we think about the books that we choose, and then we certainly have to be thinking about evidence-based approaches, instructional routines, strategies, activities, that are necessary to develop the processes and skills. So in other words, the framework in action. So we've just talked about the role of theoretical models in reading comprehension, the rope and so on, a framework for reading comprehension, a way of organizing and guiding your instruction, and we just talked about some of the critical elements of the curriculum, including a deep knowledge base, critical understandings, grade and age appropriate texts, development of academic language, and now thinking through what do the instructional routines, strategies, and activities look like. So now we're going to have an opportunity to visit at least two or three of these different areas. I can't do all of this with you today, but I can do a little bit with you. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do as I have this conversation. I want you to think about what do you do in your setting? I am not going to talk necessarily about specific strategies. I'll throw a few in here and there. For me, strategies are skills made automatic. Strategies are skills made automatic. So when you do choose a strategy, be certain that it's focused on accomplishing whatever the purpose is on developing that language process or skill that we've been talking about, or that cognitive process and skill. Okay. So I'm inviting you to be thinking about, hmm, I do that, or I do this, or I use that strategy, as I, as I share with you in general some of the things that the evidence has told us. So I begin with purpose setting, and I just want to say oh, just a teeny little bit about purpose setting to you. Purpose setting allows a student to develop a plan to guide their reading and to activate background knowledge, and it helps them sort out pertinent information. I don't know any effective teacher who doesn't begin their class by saying, today we're going to learn about. I gave you an agenda at the beginning. I was purposeful about it so that you could begin to make connections and think about how to organize instruction. So I think it's absolutely important each time right, we stand in front of our students, work with our students as we develop this framework, there will be multiple purposes for your lessons, but you need to be clear about what they are so they can make these connections. So let's focus then. Oh, I went a little too fast. 
Oh, I'm way beyond where I want to be. Hold on. I'll get back. I know why. I'm on the wrong clicker. On the clicker. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, that was quite the preview, wasn't it? (laughs) Okay, here. So let's focus on text reading key vocabulary. Okay? And let's look at a bit of evidence. So it was too quick to read before, I think. Words are carriers of meaning and are closely tied to text comprehension and knowledge construction. We all know how important vocabulary is, right? So how do we acquire vocabulary? How do we learn words? Please use these pictures now to have a conversation again with your partner about how we acquire word meaning. See if they can prompt you into a conversation. How do we learn words? Okay. All right, let's shout it out. Someone from over on the right-hand side of the room to shout it out. How do we learn words? How do we acquire vocabulary? Anyone over there? What do you mean by incidentally? Thank you. Yeah, by listening to others, right? By being surrounded by, we hope, really good language. Anyone from the middle of the room, how do we learn words? By reading a lot. Yeah, after we're able to read independently, that's the primary way that we learn words. Anyone from over here, how do we learn words? Woohoo! Explicitly teaching words. Great. Okay. So the, really, the pictures tell us there are multiple ways that we acquire words. The vocabulary attuned teacher is well aware of this, right? So we can engage in intentional on-purpose instruction. I'll focus on that today. And what do I mean by intentional on-purpose instruction? I mean explicit instruction. I mean that we go through our texts and we make some good decisions about I'm going to directly explicitly teach these words. And I'm going to use a routine to do it. And I'm going to provide multiple opportunities to work with the words, particularly as they relate to one another because that's how we store words in semantic relationships. But I'm also going to be cognizant in terms of my language in class, in small setting, as well as when I work with text, I'm going to be cognizant of the fact that there are lots of incidental on-purpose opportunities for learning words. Through my teacher talk, so I'm going to elevate my language. Through student talk, giving them opportunities to, to use their language and the words that we're teaching them. Through read alouds, Through point of contact discussions, you come to a word, you quickly give them a synonym or a substitution in the moment. Through discussions, through structured independent reading. And by structured, I mean we don't just say, go ahead and read these books. Give them some questions to answer. They can be general, but give them a purpose for reading. We also learn words through the teaching, or our students learn words, when we teach them Intentional, independent word learning strategies. So my letters colleagues are familiar with this, right? So we teach them how to use a dictionary because we're not always around. We teach them how to use context. And we remember not all contexts are created equal, so sometimes we have to be very specific about teaching how to use context clues. And by the way, that's a form of inference. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. And we teach them morphology and we're explicit about that. We create a language-rich classroom. So let's just take a few minutes now to look at that first column, and let's engage in a little bit of practice in terms of choice of words. Okay. So I've done the work for you. (laughs) All right. One of the stories that Julia had for reading about revolutionaries was a story about Benjamin Banneker. Now, some of you may know the story of Benjamin Banneker. Okay. It's in a book that Andrea Pinckney wrote about um, 10 black men who have influenced the world. Some of you know the book. Okay. So Benjamin Banneker lived in the 1700s, late 1700s. His father had been a slave. All right? He was a freed slave. Benjamin was not a slave. He grew up on a farm. I believe the farm was in Virginia. And he was very math capable. He was very interested in the stars. And so Benjamin, at an early age, began to study the stars, began to plot the stars, began to plot the lunar phases, 
all of which he realized was quite helpful in terms of farming. And along came Thomas Jefferson and signed the Declaration of Independence. And Benjamin was pretty astute. He had been trying to get his almanac. He put all of his findings into an almanac published. So he was a good writer. He realized he could read and write, but many of his fellow black men and women could not because they were enslaved. And Thomas Jefferson signed the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. But he owned slaves. And that bothered Benjamin. So Benjamin wrote him a letter. Can you imagine? And he called him to task. He didn't call him a hypocrite in the letter, but that's really what he thought about him. Benjamin went on to get a response from Thomas Jefferson. He didn't give up his slaves, but he sort of apologized for them, right? And Benjamin continued to do what? To advocate for freedom, to advocate for opportunity for his fellow black men and women so they could learn how to read and write. They could read his almanac. They could have opportunities. He helped to survey Washington, D.C., George Washington asked him to. So they would have those same opportunities. He was a revolutionary. So here are just a few words that if Julia or I were teaching this unit, that we might choose to teach. Notice they all connect in some way. The words that we choose connect back to critical understandings. Abolitionist, humanitarian, hope, assertive, courageous, and of course the word revolutionaries. And think about those other books that I had up before that Julia was going to use. Many of these words would do what? They would cross over. You'd find them. You'd be able to apply them to these other characters. So a critical question here in terms of word use is certainly usefulness, growth, can I generate other words from it, and these critical understandings. Is it connected to critical key concepts and critical understandings? And so if I looked at some examples, okay, from AIM, again, this is a draft, we could go through and we would see in the left-hand corner, those questions that are on the framework, and these are the units, again, that I showed you earlier. They would be words that relate back to, how would they choose vocabulary, usefulness, growth, and so on, but they would relate back to these critical understandings, all of the words. They're not all identified here. It's just saying how the criteria they might use. All right. Now, the other thing is, when you think about vocabulary, you have to think about routines. So you don't say, let's look up the word in the dictionary. We all know that doesn't work. You don't say, here's the meaning of the word. You don't say, let's write a sentence in our journal. No, you use a routine, and you use a routine that taps into everything that we know about how students actually learn vocabulary words. We need to tap into the phonological aspect of the word, the linguistic aspects of the word, the definitional aspects, the contextual, the orthographic, and linguistic again. This is what we call a simple routine. I've also designed a more complex routine, but this is the simple routine for vocabulary instruction. So what does it look like or sound like? So listen, everyone. Listen, you're all my students now. Listen. Revolutionaries. Repeat the word. Let's listen to that word again. Revolutionaries. How many? Oh, good. Go ahead. Repeat it again. Good. We're hearing it. We're thinking about it. How many syllables are in the word revolutionaries? Let's put the number of fingers up for the number of syllables that we hear. rev o lu shun er I've got some really great people. Yeah. Okay. I know. It just did something, didn't it? Oh, no. Did it go back to the beginning? Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. All right, so revolutionaries. We'll keep going with revolutionaries and see if I can catch up. Okay, what do we have to do next then? We have to provide some definitional information, right? So what we want to do is we want to do a student-friendly definition for revolutionaries. So if I think a little bit about revolutionaries, I might say, you know, it sounds like that word revolution. It sounds like revolutionary. I wonder what it means. What does revolution mean? Oh, it means to react to something, I think. To push back against something. 
So I wonder what a revolutionary is. I know it's a person because I'm talking about Benjamin Banneker. Okay. So I might say, well, a revolutionary is a person who reacted to what? He reacted to the fact that his fellow man, his black brothers and sisters, weren't free. Right? He pushed back against it. Right? He tried to do something about it. So a revolutionary is someone who reacts to something, who takes action right, for a particular purpose. And then I could go and I could put it into a context, and I've partially already done that. Sorry about this. It's a little distracting. Right. Um, I could put it into a context. Well, Benjamin Banneker was a revolutionary. Why? Well, we've just read about him. You know what? He reacted. He pushed back against this whole idea of slavery. In fact, he became an abolitionist. Do you know anyone who's a revolutionary? And now, at this point in time, what you have to do is depend upon what it is that you've taught your students up to this point in time. What have they learned in their curriculum? Have they been talking about, you know, the Revolutionary War, for instance? And we have a unit on the long journey to freedom that actually does work on the Revolutionary War. So we begin to make connections. Or have we already had some conversations about some of these other characters? You know, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and so on. So can we make connections too? So what do we do? We repeat the word. We talk a bit about its linguistic structure. We listen to it. I mean, because it's multisyllabic, we're not going to do what the initial sound, the final sound is. We're going to work with syllables, right? We're also going to think a little bit about its context, its definition, its context, definitional information. We're almost there, thank heavens. And then what we're going to do is we're going to then show our students the word. We're going to show them the word revolutionary. And we're going to have some conversation with them about how to spell it. Revolutionary. But we can also talk about, hmm, do you think there's some suffixes here? Yeah. What's, what's the part of speech, do you think, for revolutionaries? So talking about the phonological aspect, which connects to linguistics, talking about the definitional aspect, student-friendly, putting it in a context from the reading, providing some additional context for it. Remember, this is just this simple routine. And then seeing it, examining the orthography of it. How do we spell it? Right? And then what's its part of speech? So I'm going to give you a word to do. Right? I'm going to give you the sequence up here. And I want you to be thinking about the word assertive. Okay, assertive was one of the words that I had on the list. And I'll give you a little bit of background on assertive. I'll give you some of the language. Assertive is Latin-based. It comes from a Latin root that means to stand up. So Benjamin Banneker did what? He stood up for the rights of his fellow man, right? It can also mean confident, forceful, um, bold, decisive, and so on. Okay. So just partner up now and have some conversations about how you might go about teaching that word using this routine. Okay? Conversation now about the word assertive. All right, if you can finish your conversations. Yeah? Okay. So here's what I might have, if I could come down and hear you, here's what I might have heard you talking about. Listen assertive, and your students would repeat assertive. Let's listen again, and let's see if we can hear the number of syllables. In that particular word, assertive, you don't have an identifiable root. If there was an identifiable root, I might say, do you hear an identifiable root or a prefix or a suffix? You could ask about a suffix here. You could do that here, the morphology. And they might say, if, I hear if at the end. Cool, right? Now let's talk about what it means. Student friendly again. All right, putting it in a context, Benjamin Banneker certainly was assertive. He was bold and confident. Just imagine writing a letter to Thomas Jefferson. You could ask about a situation in which they've been assertive or in which you've been assertive. You could provide it yourself. And then you would want them to see it, say it, write it. You could have further conversation about part of speech if you hadn't already done that with if. You see how you're pulling all those meanings together? So I always think about the triangle, all right? 
phonology, orthography, and meaning, those connections, those neural networks connecting, how do we lay down these clear, crisp representations of words? We do it by connecting phonology, orthography, and meaning. Right? And that's why the routine is as it is. And it's been morphed over time. It keeps changing each time that I hear someone else speak to this. Now, this is direct explicit teaching, right? This is intentional on purpose. So you want kids to own these words. So it isn't going to be enough to just do the routine. You're going to have to do multiple activities with them, right? And you're going to have to keep returning to the words. So I included this, and I just wanted to quickly share it with you. So word choice, all right, there are different ways we go about choosing words, and there are different ways that we can have defi kids define words. But if you looked in this third column, and you looked at building connections, you would want, want your kids creating semantic maps. You'd want them to do scaling, assertive versus non-assertive. You could picture that at the two ends of the arrows. You'd want them to think about some attributes. What does assertive sound like, look like? In what circumstances would you be assertive? You also might want some visuals. And by the way, oftentimes we use a visual to actually introduce the meaning of the word. So with revolutionaries, I could have put up, for instance, if kiddos knew about revolutionary war, I could have put up a scene depicting the revolutionary war and said, what do you know about this picture? And that could have led me into revolutionaries. Or you can do the pictures as they're defining the words themselves. Keep in mind that a definition, asking your kids to write definitions, that's the end result. They can write your definition, your student-friendly definition, but the end result is can they define the word? All right. And then using the word in writing. So again, I want to say to you that one of the reasons that I think we should be writing about what we're learning about while we make these connections between what we're learning for meaning or what we're you know, acquiring through reading and making meaning, we should be writing about because then we can use our vocabulary. Then we can use our sentence structures. We can use our background knowledge. It provides those nice opportunities for students. So there's all different ways that we can engage students. So just coming back and reminding you, all right, I've only talked about this intentional on-purpose instruction column. And I've only just given you a little bit of it, right? But what's important to think about here is you have to think about all three things. Because if you want your students to have an academic vocabulary, it will not be sufficient alone to teach words explicitly. That's a small portion of the words that they'll acquire over time. Okay. So let's move on then. And let's move to another part of the framework. Let's move to language structures, phrases, clauses, and sentences. Those of you who know me well know that probably about six or seven years ago, I started talking about sentence comprehension. Did workshops here at IPA on it. And um, I'm thrilled when I hear people now talk about syntax. All right, it wasn't my idea necessarily. It came out of the work with letters, but um, it kind of pushed me in, in, in terms of thinking more and more about it. So I'm thrilled when I see it being focused on. What's the evidence tell us about syntax? Longitudinal studies paint a picture of an important role for sentence level syntactic knowledge in relation to reading comprehension outcomes. We've heard over and over and over again it's a predictor. Okay? Marilyn Adams, trying to read without syntax is like doing math without the operations. What is syntax? It's a vehicle for conveying meaning. Try to keep that in mind. It's not just plain old boring grammar. It's a vehicle for conveying meaning. You cannot separate out a noun from its meaning. It answers a question, who or what? Every part of speech answers a question. So syntax is a vehicle for conveying meaning. So as we think about instruction, and this is adapted from letters, as we think about instruction and instructional approaches for working with sentence comprehension, for working with syntax, we can think about, again, incidental on purpose versus intentional on purpose instruction. And I'm not going to talk so much about the left-hand column. I'm going to focus on two different activities from the right-hand column. So what are two ways, if you're preparing a text, that you might dive into directly and explicitly, dive into sentence comprehension? And one, you could do grammar-based activities. And I'll show you one in a minute. But you also can do cohesive tie and connective activities. Remember I said to you, students 
who have problems with comprehension have difficulty integrating meaning within and between sentences. Cohesive ties link up the ideas. Okay, so we're going there in a minute. Okay. So, I love this quote. Well, I love this quote. There it is. Okay. All right. Take a moment and read it to yourself. Right? So I know in letters, Louisa talks about sentences kind of filling these linguistic slots, right? The words fill the linguistic slots, and we end up with sentences. They convey meaning. And if we think a little bit about how we build meaning, we build it from the word up, right? So whether we're reading or we're writing, we start with our words, our parts of speech. We move to our phrases very often, and there are all sorts of different types of phrases. We, we move to our clauses, independent and dependent, Right? We move to our t- types of sentences, simple, compound, complex. And yes, there's a compound complex we could talk about as well. And then together, these things do what? They combine into text for us. And these cohesive ties, these semantic and syntactic devices, assist us in bridging and integrating the information. And I know I keep saying that. Think about pronoun reference. Nancy was walking down the, st- the street. She tripped and fell. Who's she? Nancy. That's a pronoun referent. That's a cohesive tie. I've tied up or I've integrated meaning between the two sentences. Right? The dog ran away. The canine was hungry. Who's the canine? The dog. That's a substitution. So authors use substitution synonyms as ways of linking up ideas within and between sentences. And then we have conjunctions that also serve this function. So again, when we think about our curriculum, when we think about our design of curriculum, right, we have to start thinking about how these parts of speech, if we're looking at grammar, how parts of speech contribute to meaning, if we begin at the beginning. And this little uh, cartoon says, I can hardly read it from here, but you probably say pronouns. It's something about we haven't even learned about amateur nouns yet or something like that. (laughs) All right. So this is just the beginnings. As I said at AIM, we have a draft going of the overview of our curriculum. We're revising it, thinking through now, as we move from grade to grade, what parts of speech might we be focused on? All right. So making that connection again. So here's an activity then. That's based on the Benjamin Banneker, all right? And what have I done here? What I've done is I've gone through and I've begun to select words and I've begun to sort them based on the function that they play within a particular text selection, and it happens to be Benjamin Banneker. How does it tie back to those processes I was talking about? right, well, it ties back in terms of sentence comprehension, but also a microprocess. Remember I said one of those cognitive processes are this ability to kind of grab onto the idea units, right? Well, the parts of speech do what? They convey ideas, but they convey ideas in different ways. They have different functions. So if I'm asking a who or a what question, in this particular case, some of the words that might answer that question would include Thomas Jefferson, opportunity, letter, slavery, abolitionist. If I'm asking what was going on and Israel was doing, wrote, live up to, yes, that's a phrase, hoped, and slaves responded. If I'm asking which one, what kind, how many, fullest, unfair, oppressed, passionate, pleased, or when, where, why, and how, someday, not so long ago, during the revolution, right away, after the signing of the declaration, I can begin to work with words in this way, I can give these words out to my students. I can say to them, who has a word that answers the question who? Or I can say to them, as a small group, let's look at these words. How do you think these words connect? Could you possibly predict what this story is about if I selected the right words? All right. Who is it going to be about? What do you think is going to happen? When do you think it might happen? I can use all sorts of different questions just based on my parts of speech and getting kiddos to think about, wow, as I think about the ideas, I have to find the who and the do's. I have to find the which ones, what kinds, how many, and so on. So making use of, and this can just be a warm-up activity even, at the beginning of your reading, making use of grammar activities to get kiddos to think about how to deconstruct. Okay. The other thing I can do is I can work with cohesive ties, and I gave you a little prelude to this. So 
Cohesive ties are critical to integrating meaning and reading and writing. So pronoun reference. We're going to look at an example out of Benjamin Banneker. Substitutions and synonyms and conjunctions. All right? They have everything to do with these microprocesses, these idea units, and then the integration, an integrative process, right? We said that was one of the cognitive processes. Okay. So here's the pronoun referent. Take a moment and read it to yourself. And I've done the hard work for you. I have boxed. That's the code I used. We can teach kids different codes. We can take parts of selections out and work with selections. Just keep the code consistent. And I've boxed all the cohesive, t- uh, rather, pronoun reference for what? Who does they, they, no one, them, and it reference? Black Americans. Exactly, black Americans. So my question might be, after I've directly and explicitly taught this and modeled it, right, if this were the selection I were giving them after doing that direct explicit teaching, I might say to them, okay, everyone, I want you to find all the words that represent or refer back to black Americans. I want you to think about the number of kids that you probably have sitting in front of you, then when they get to something like no one or them, they have no clue who that is. They don't realize that it goes back to the black Americans. Now, that won't happen for all students, but it will happen for many of your students. Okay, that's one type of cohesive tie. Here's another one, synonyms and substitutions. Okay, and I've done this one for you as well. Notice that I've used an arrow in this instance too. And again, the code is arbitrary, (laughs) right? So Benjamin was telling Thomas Jefferson that he was a great man, but the Secretary of State did not live, I should say, up to, according to the promises he set forth in in the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson owned slaves who he counted as his property. So Thomas Jefferson, I underlined, where is there a synonym or substitution for Thomas Jefferson? Well, the arrow's going to it. Great man. So if I say, can you find another word or word that means Thomas Jefferson that's referencing? Oh, great man. Is there something in the second sentence? Secretary of State. If I were doing pronoun reference, I could say he set forth. If I get to the very last sentence, I can say Jefferson owned slaves who he counted as his property. Who does property reference back to? What is property a synonym or substitution for? Slaves. So this is what authors do, all right? They don't use the same words over and over and over again. They use pronoun reference. They substitute in. It's the way that they integrate or combine ideas within and between sentences. And oftentimes, our kiddos just don't get that. Okay, what's the third type? And there are more than three types of uh, cohesive ties. All right, these are just three common ones. Conjunctions. So here I've used the coding of underlining, okay? And again, arbitrary. And what I would say to you about conjunctions is we think about teaching these for writing. You have to teach them for reading comprehension. I had them included in on academic language vocabulary in that chart that I showed you or that graphic, right? We need to teach them but means what? It's kind of a reversal, right? Going in the opposite direction. But, but, wait. Because, what? We're going to have some kind of connection, problem solution, cause and effect, right? Because. And then and is what? It's just a connective. It connects up ideas, right? All right. So, your turn, okay? I want you to read this, right? The word that's underlined is Benjamin. See if you can find everything that references or stands for Benjamin in this short paragraph. Quickly, partner up, pair up, and see if you can find both the pronoun reference and the substitution synonyms for Benjamin. Okay? So you've got the first black man, okay? That's Benjamin. The only black person... That's Benjamin. And then we've got he and he'd, and that's Benjamin. Look at all the cohesive ties just in a couple of sentences. So even just questioning and checking in, you know, with your students. Or saying, just take this paragraph. Let's do a warm-up. Just take this paragraph and find all the substitutions or synonyms. Draw arrows to connect them for me. Right? And that can be a mini-assessment, and then you can have conversation about it. Don't overlook it. Now, there are many other things that you can do with sentences and syntax. Those are just two simple examples that I've given you. 
Okay. All right. So we're going to move on, and we're going to move down now to levels of understanding. Okay. And I'm going to talk just briefly about inference. So when we begin to think about this arrow going back and forth, I want to say to you, you ask questions at the word, at the sentence, at the text level. You ask questions that are at surface level, the answers are right there in the text. Some of you are probably thinking QAR right now, right? Okay. Question, answer, response. Yeah. That's okay. Bring in your strategies. I invited you to do that. Okay. So right there, I can find the answer. Some of your questions will be text level, which means students have to integrate their background knowledge. So questions that have to do with inference, more often than not, are going to be text level. Some will be mental model, and those are more like an application kind of question. So you've got your exact words, your surface level. You've got your derived meaning, your text level. And then you have your overall, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. You've got your overall representation of the meaning of the text. Okay? So when we think about levels of understanding, just think that those questions can run throughout the framework, that they're not just overall about the passage. They can be about the word, the sentence, the passage, the overall passage, and they can be at different levels. Now, I will say to you that if you want to move beyond the surface level of the text, your kids are going to need knowledge. So those of you, again, who know me have heard me say this more than once. You can teach strategies till the cows come home, but if your kids don't have background knowledge, it doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean a thing. You cannot answer an inferential question without background knowledge. An inference is a complicated thing. It occurs at different levels. It, even the use of cohesive ties involves some inference. The integration of background knowledge involves inference. There are different kinds of inferencing, right? But absolutely, absolutely essential to making meaning, to critical understanding, is the reader's knowledge. And Kinch said this quite a while ago. The writer must always rely on reader's knowledge to some degree. Lexical, syntactic, semantic, domain knowledge, personal experience, and so on. So knowledge is absolutely critical. Now, when you think about inference, okay, what is inference? Well, it's the identification of meaningful relationships between various parts of the text, right? So we usually think about gap-filling inferences, where you have to assume what it is that the reader wanted you to bring, and you infer. Based on, the, based on what the reader provides for you, you use the reader's, uh, sorry, the author's word, right? But you have to bring some of your own knowledge. So you're making connections between what, what the author has provided and your background knowledge. It is a necessary condition for creating a mental model of the text, if you want your kids to get to the highest level of understanding, they have to be able to make inference. Okay. A major difference between shallow and deep level of comprehension of text has to do with inferences and other connections generated by the reader. I always think about those little kids from years ago. You know, I was a regular teacher way, way back when. And my little reading groups, right? I don't even remember what I called them, but I know I had reading groups, and I had different texts, and I know I asked them different kinds of questions. And I know for the kids that I felt weren't as capable as some of the other kids, I asked them very low-level questions. I asked them what we all call literal questions. I asked them questions they could find the answers to in the text. I never gave them sufficient, guilty, hand up, I never gave them sufficient practice with these other kinds of questions. If you don't do that, they'll never learn how to deal with those questions. You have to scaffold this for them. And one of the ways you do that is by building this background knowledge through critical understanding. Things are not disconnected when you approach comprehension this way. It's not I read this story for these two days and now I'm jumping to something else with a totally different theme. No, let's read about many things, many different genres, from different perspectives, different disciplines to develop these understandings. So what are some of the practices that we know? And I'm Getting close here, so I realize that. Some evidence-based practices. 
for inference? Well, questioning is probably the most critical strategy that you have um, in your uh, toolbox. The use of visual cues, I'm going to show you in a moment some visual cues. Think alouds. You know, when you actually read through and you think aloud a model for your student, graphic organizers, I'm going to show you a graphic organizer in a minute that has visual cues on it, or a combination of. And here I've just reminded you that, you know, with each and every one of these different facets or aspects of language processing, these can be done as warm-ups, these can be done as small group instruction, these can be done as whole class. You know your students. You use the framework overall to design your instruction. How much or how little, how differentiated is dependent upon your students. So here's, here's an approach for inference. Searching for clues in their connections. So you say to your students, I'll model this for you. I'll think this aloud. I'm going to read the text. I'm going to frame some questions, provide some prompts that will be related to my purpose for reading the text. Then I'm going to find some clues within the text and I'm going to surface my background knowledge and make a connection, right? And that will allow for me to make an inference. Now, how do I scaffold that for kids, right? How do I scaffold it? Well, if I want them to get at character trait, for instance, or character emotions or motivation, I might scaffold it with a graphic organizer that looks something like this. You know, I want you to think some things I know about this character. Listen as I read. Some things I have heard the character say, listen as I read. Some things I know the character has done, listen as I read. So you see the prompts or the questions, the statements that allow them to begin to dig a little deeper, right? You're scaffolding for them. Or something else that you think about. And then you pose the question, tell me something about the motivation of Benjamin Banneker. Right? So as, they're, as you're reading, you can be using that kind of an organizer. So listen and collect some information about the character. You can have conversation. You can do the think aloud, model it for them, and then scaffold it again for them with the next selection that you read. Okay. Here's another way that we might use questioning coupled with graphic organizers. Here's the question. Why do you think Benjamin Banneker wrote to John, Thomas Jefferson? Now, I'm going to use what the text told me. Remember visual cues. I'm going to go to the book. So see my little book? Here's what the book told me. And again, direct explicit teaching, modeling, scaffolding. Jefferson signed the Declaration of Independence. Most black men and women were enslaved in the late 1700s. This is right in the book. You know, the book told me this. Jefferson owned slaves. Oh, and Banneker was an abolitionist. Now, what do I know based on all of that? What do I know about slavery? What do I know about Benjamin Banneker's character? What do I know about abolition? So here's what I think in terms of the answer to that question. Why do I think he wrote that letter? So this is like a guided kind of discovery in a way because you're scaffolding all through. Um, you know, many of our students have the knowledge base, but they don't surface it. And so they need something like this. This is Elbro's research um, in scientific studies of reading, maybe last year or the year before, talked about scaffolding with questions and having students go back to the book and you providing the prompts. Right? and working through it with them. All right. So I'm sorry, that's just a teeny bit on inference. I do a whole workshop on inference, maybe another time. Okay. So thinking then about the fact that the framework, as you think about the framework, it's before, during, and after. The arrow is running throughout. Of course, purpose should be set up front. Okay. Um, and thinking about what instructional routines, what activities, what strategies can I use that do what link directly back to those language processes and skills. It's a development of process and skill. Now, what about that expression of understanding? Wow, she finally got to product. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I just want to say to you that I happen to have a bent toward writing. <laughs> but there are many ways that kids can express their understanding. All right? I want you to know, though, based on this particular report, writing about a text enhances how well students comprehend it. Teaching writing not only improves how well students write, it also enhances their ability to read a text accurately, fluently, and with comprehension. You see, I think about the strands of the rope 
And I think, which of those strands do you use when you write? You use sentence structure. You use vocabulary. You use background knowledge, right? You use discourse structures. Now, you use much more than that when you write, but look at how you've provided a foundation for students to be able to write about what they're learning about. You know how often you give students a prompt and they don't know anything about it? And then you're going to measure their writing based on that? Mm -mm. So we're reinforcing. Now you may have been thinking a little bit about assessment. How do you assess all this? And I have to, I'll share with you some beginning work, but this is not finished work. This is work that I've been working on for a while. All right? So is it possible to take that reading rope and those levels of language processing and to develop classroom-based assessments, tasks that align with the purpose of each of those different components of the framework. And I will tell you that I worked a bit with Melissa Farrell on this. Some of you may have attended her session. She's phenomenally wonderful. A book on reading assessment is great. And I've worked on it on my own, and I've shared it out with some of my colleagues. And it's not quite ready, right? But it's in development in terms of what are those tasks that are most appropriate for the different components of language processes. So not all things measure things in the same way, right? And we want to be certain that the tasks that we're using are giving us, good back, giving us back good information on product that the students can express understanding in terms of these different levels of language processing. So this is a work in progress. I will just say that much about it. I will also say to you I'm fortunate that my colleagues at AIM, the two teachers actually who were presenting a poster this afternoon, um, one of them has been so generous in sharing the exams that they give at the end of book and asking me to comment on, well, the quizzes or the tests, I won't call them exams, to comment and tell them are they hitting on all the different strands of the rope? Could I make suggestion to them about other kinds of questions? So this kind of back and forth is so critical in terms of thinking through assessment. All right. So in our last few moments, what I want to do is I want to end with this other question that I posed at some point earlier, which had to do with how do we design and deliver professional development that informs the decision-making all of you have to make. And I want to share some things out with you. There isn't anyone in this room who doesn't know that we need a deep knowledge base. Comprehension, never mind comprehension, reading is incredibly complex. Writing is incredibly complex. And the students that most of us are working with are the most complex. So learning is our work. It's one of my favorite sayings, Michael Fullan. Learning is our work, and we need to be informed. Now, we have standards. IDA has given us standards, right? that provide guidance for us in terms of what the knowledge base is that we need. We can turn to other documents like this IES document or literature regarding professional development, which has been in existence for a very long time. I was a director of professional development in my past life. Right? I did no stand up and deliver. I did facilitation of change by providing professional learning opportunities. And what do I mean by that? I love that you're all here with me today, but this is just a little piece, isn't it? In order for us to put in place effective practice and to maintain and sustain, we need multiple options. We need coaching. We need to link our student assessment data to instruction. We need to use our technology, e-workshops, webinars. We need to participate in communities of practice. So when we think about what that might look like, we need to think about training, right? The fact that we all need training or workshop in the area of comprehension. And so the teachers that I've worked with in different settings, we've done workshops, not only Letters Module 6 and other things, we've done workshops that took that framework, that looked at, as we started to do today, every single piece, and I modeled, and then you practice, right? We need webinars. We need things that we can return to that are accessible to us. Right? Webinars that, for instance, are based on the strands of the rope. We need collaborative decisions and discussions. We need to share out our practice with one another. Right? 
We need consultation. We need coaching and fidelity checks. I will tell you that we've been working with implementation science at AIM Academy. I know Wilson has worked with implementation science, and many of you perhaps have had that experience. And we've been developing what we call classroom fidelity checklists. Well, what are those all about? What they do is they identify the teacher behaviors that you would expect to see if, in fact, instruction is aligned with the framework. They define the observable behaviors for vocabulary, for instance. They're not evaluative. They're meant to serve as a base for professional conversation. So as a coach or a literacy leader, a visit to a classroom, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, the use of a checklist, yes, I saw the teacher saying the word, asking for the linguistic structure, defining the word in student-friendly terms, putting it in context, just a simple checklist, and then a conversation with the teacher or a grade group or more in terms of here's what we're seeing, not what I saw in your classroom or your classroom. Here's what we're seeing. Now, how do we support you professionally? Because we see some stellar performance, even though we're not rating. There's no rating scale, right? We see some, some performances right on target. And then we see some things that we need to keep working at. What do we need to give to you to support you professionally so that we all have all these practices, routines, and so on in place? And then, of course, the one that I think often gets for forgotten, curriculum development. Because how do we really understand that framework? Only if we work with our curriculum. Only if we think through our own instruction. What are our enduring understandings? What books are we choosing? What does the vocabulary look like? What does our unit organizer look like? Not our daily, everyday lesson plan. Let's just get a big picture going here. I've also had the opportunity, it's been interesting, for working with a large district in North Carolina, Charlotte Mecklenburg, on a professional learning community two years using the framework. Right? What have we done in that professional learning community? Almost all of these things that are represented in this cycle. So I think I want to leave you with this message that we're, we're so often expected to do so, so many things. And we're not always as well supported as we need to be. So we all have to be advocates for, we deserve professional learning, right? That's our work as well as our students' work. Right? So hopefully as you leave here today, I hope some ideas or points resonated with you. Right? Some of my audience recognizes this. I just used something like this in Pennsylvania last week. I hope something squared with your beliefs and practices. And I bet there's still some questionings going round and round in your mind <laughs> about what we um, talked about today. But I know that we're just about at the end of our talk. So constructing meaning. I hope you constructed a new mental model about comprehension here today. Thank you so much for participating. There's my email. You can email me, and I'll stay for questions.